Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and before we get started, I just want to say that I hope you're safe and healthy. Today, we're looking at Wreck, a Spanish found footage film from 2007 that's also the first non-English language movie to be featured on The Kill Count. Sorry it took so long. I've always included Wreck among my list of scariest horror movies, because I think found footage is terrifying when it's done right, and goddamn does Wreck do it right. Taking the format of a late night local access show, Wreck follows a reporter, some emergency workers, and a whole bunch of residents as they find themselves locked inside an apartment building under quarantine. Which, yes, is why I'm covering this today. I know a lot of you are stuck at home and probably bored right now, so I wanted to fast track a kill count with subject matter you could relate to. And by that, I hopefully don't mean you have a crazy zombie niece running around. <laughs> So you can consider this a bonus Corona kill count. I know some people wanted me to do Contagion, but that's not a horror movie. So instead, I'm gonna give you Wreck today, and on Friday, it's American remake Quarantine. I'll also note that Wreck does have three sequels, but I'm gonna skip them for now and maybe come back to them later. This wasn't meant to be my next franchise on the kill count. That's coming up in May. Also, for the kill count itself, I'll be including people both as they die and as they're confirmed infected. Most of the time, the infected people here just don't stay down, no matter how much they get beat on. So as a present to you big number fans, I'll put people on the list as soon as they show clear signs of infection. Finally, one last note, this movie's got a lot of flashing lights throughout. Too many for me to continually warn you about. So photosensitive fans, you might want to just sit this one out. Sorry. All that being said, let's grab our camcorders and get to the kills slash infections. The movie begins with a reporter. Angela Vidal is the host of a Barcelonan program called While You're Sleeping, which follows people who work throughout the night. Angela is played by Manuela Velasco, a real-life Spanish TV presenter who was cast so the role could be performed as naturally as possible. Realism was a huge priority for co-directors Paco Plaza and Jaume Balaguerro, and I think their devotion to creating that credibility is a big reason why this movie's so scary. Tonight, Angela is covering a local fire station full of hungry, hungry firefighting boys who have to spend the whole night prepared to respond to an emergency, even though most of their calls aren't that big a deal, as firefighter Alex here says. O para rescatar mascotas, por ejemplo, eso también, que aunque suene atópico, es verdad, rescatamos mascotas. Although Alex y Manu, el otro bombero principal, are played by actors, most, if not all, of the other firefighters were non-actors who actually worked at this real-life fire station. It's probably why the their on-screen awkwardness feels so sincere. With no fires being reported though, Anjala is bored, even though she gets to spend the night looking at shirtless firefighters and playing hoops. Sounds like a sweet gig, Anjala. Quit complaining. She gets her wish for more excitement when the station siren goes off and everyone is scrambled into action. Anjala wants to get in on that pole sliding, but her cameraman Pablo is unable to with his gear. We never see Pablo in front of the camera, but he's played by the film's actual director of photography, Pablo Rosso, who spends the whole movie both acting from behind the camera and running around to film everything. Angela and Pablo join Manu and Alex as they arrive at the apartment building where the call was made from, located on Barcelona's popular Rambla de Catalunya. They enter through the wrought iron doors to find a number of people in the lobby, all played by unknown actors who were cast based on their ability to improvise. Directors Balaguerro and Plaza didn't give any of their actors a completed script, so nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. Instead, they just had to react naturally to all the crazy shit happening around them. One of the apartment building's residents is young mother Marie Carmen, who made the emergency call after she heard shouting from the upper floors. The police are already here, and one of them leads the firefighters and the news crew upstairs, warning Angela and Pablo to stay out of the way. Angela does a stand-up as the emergency workers break into the third floor apartment of an older resident, a woman named Con Chita Izquierdo, who, uh, does not seem to be doing that great. And it doesn't look any better with more light. Since Conchita is clearly infected already, she's the first to go on our list. Conchita freaks out and flashes her granny panties before straight up attacking and biting the older police officer. They pull her off of him and drag the injured officer down the hallway. And as they leave Conchita's apartment, Angela gives us our requisite found footage raison d'etoile. <laughs> 
They carry the officer downstairs, his neck missing way too much neck there, but fortunately, one of the residents, a dude named Guillaume, is a medic's assistant who's able to stabilize the cop for now. But looks like they're not going to be able to leave this place to get him any additional help. Obviously, nobody is pleased about this development, and Angela uses it as further justification for why they need to keep filming, so people can see what's happening to them. Filming non-stop was no small feat for the movie's real-life production. Not only did the cast and crew have to endure 12-hour shooting days that took place at night, they also had to rehearse a whole lot for the film's very long takes, like the more than 5-minute take that starts in the fire engine outside and goes all the way to Conchita's attack without the camera ever cutting. The actors weren't the only ones who had to rehearse either. There's a whole bunch of crew members, like sound engineers, who had to constantly hide themselves and stay out of frame while performing their roles. The younger police officer, Sergio, and firefighter Manu take control and try to figure out a way for them to leave. Not only for the older officer, who's still bleeding out, but also for this little girl, Jennifer, who needs antibiotics. <laughs> oh, and also for firefighter Alex, who just face planted against the ground. It's a great scare in the movie that I'm glad they got right after at least one take where they messed up dropping the dummy. You'll get it next time, guy, no worries. They hear screams coming from upstairs, so Sergio and Manu go to investigate, with Pablo and Angela following a little later. Inside Conchita's apartment, they hear some heavy breathing and whimpering. Why don't you go check that shit out, Pablo? <laughs> Yeah, on second thought, never mind. It's a younger woman who collapses and dies at their feet. We're told later that she was a Colombian woman, but all we know right now is that she was killed by Conchita. Sergio, seeing this, draws his gun, and when Conchita charges towards him, he's forced to shoot her down. Having apparently killed a woman, Sergio's a little shaken up. Vamos, vamos. Es que, si me ha encima, no... No, and of course, it doesn't help that it was all captured on camera. They come back downstairs, where the apartment residents have raised a metal gate that leads to a textile shop in the building. They really want to get out of here, even though Officer Sergio tries to enforce the quarantine. But the building's back door is also shuttered, and the scary megaphone voice outside tells them to knock it off and stay inside. It's clear that something's terribly wrong, especially since Spanish Sherman Hemsley over here says that none of their TVs or phones are working. Angela and Pablo join Guillaume and Manu as they go to the second floor and make their way through an office. But this exit too is off limits, guarded by cops and good boys. <laughs> The actors in this scene had no idea they were going to see all this chaos outside the windows, which makes for one of the most unsettling moments of the movie, as the building is sealed off with tarps that create a spooky background of silhouetted figures. Climb on up that ladder now, guy! Come 2am, everyone is still stuck inside, so Pablo passes the time by filming Guillaume as he takes care of the injured guys. Angela and Pablo also do some interviews, letting us familiarize ourselves with the other residents slash future victims. There's an older couple who bicker and, spoiler alert, disappear from the movie pretty soon, a Japanese immigrant family of a wife, husband, and son, that sick little girl Jennifer, who says that she misses her dog Max, who's at the vet because he's a sick good boy, and that sassy Caesar guy, who's just a little too eager to blame the Japanese family for what's happening. Así salen y entran gritando todo el tiempo en chino, en japonés, no sé, hablan algo que no se entiende nada, horror. They all gather around as Sergio tells them the latest news. Turns out there's an infection in the building and everyone needs to get tested. Fine! He does a census of the residents and learns that the top floor apartment has been uninhabited for some time. It's owned by a guy from Madrid who's never there. Way to drive up rent prices, asshole. The residents are told to open up the front door for a visit from a heavily hazmatted health inspector. And no, none of you are allowed outside yet. Get back, motherfucker. You don't know me like that. Angela and Pablo spy through a window and watch as the 
the health inspector handcuffs the injured Alex to his gurney, before injecting him with a shot of who knows what kind of drugs. Hmm? Before the health inspector can reveal any useful information, the injured older police officer up and attacks him, causing a grade A clusterfuck to ensue, during which the cop and Alex are confirmed to be infected, especially evident when Alex bites Guillaume. Because of that bite, the health inspector locks Guillaume inside the room, telling Manu it's too risky to let him out. <laughs> To prove his point, a newly infected Guillaume slams against the glass window of the door and bloodies it as he tries to escape. Everyone runs back to the lobby and closes the gate behind them. The health inspector finally agrees to dump some exposition on the residents, telling them that yesterday, a vet called saying that a dog with an unknown infection had become super violent. It attacked all the other animals there, turning them violent as well, until they all had to be sent off to a quarantine upstate. The the dog was Jennifer's dog, Max, of course, so right now that little girl's sickness is looking pretty sus. Yeah, but like, does she though? Cause I don't know if tonsillitis usually makes you puke blood onto your mom's face. Whoa, little girl. You know what? That's a good way to get put down for a na- No, you get back here, young missy! Shout out to Jennifer's actor, Claudia Silva, who patiently sat through an uncomfortable makeup process for the movie after earning the role with one energetic audition. <laughs> Marie's hysterical reaction to her zombie daughter gets her handcuffed to the banister, as the health inspector sends Sergio and Manu upstairs to put the infected little girl down with an injection. And uh, Pablo's gonna come too. For posterity, they find Jennifer standing and waiting for them in the darkness, looking real nasty and festering all of a sudden. Rex's makeup effects were done by David Ambit of Inside Effects, whose relationship with his parents may sound relatable to some horror fans. David Ambit, su padre le quería llevar al psicólogo porque cuando era pequeño iba solo a ver las películas gore. Lo más chungo es que esto es verdad. It's been Sergio is brave and or stupid enough to try to inject the little terror with some night-night juice, but when his guard is let down, she attacks him. Screaming up an ear-shattering storm, she gets a good bite out of the young cop's neck. He tells the others to get out of there while he drags Jennifer away, and since this is the last time we see him not infected, I'm putting him on the list. On their way back downstairs, it's clear that all hell has broken loose. People are running back to their apartments, and infected Guillaume is trying to get through the gate, and did that health inspector just kind of choke that lady in handcuffs? Kinky! They don't have the keys to free Marie, since Sergio had them and he's currently fighting a zombie child upstairs. So Marie is stuck in place as Guillaume and the older police officer finally get through the gate. Manu and the news crew escape up the stairs as Marie is attacked and killed by the infected. The survivors are welcomed into Caesar's apartment for safety, and they brace the door shut against their attackers trying to get in. They hear them give up and head further upstairs, leaving them free to despair about their present situation. Doesn't help that the health inspector's here and that he's apparently been bit. Knowing the value of social distancing, he tells the others to leave and locks himself behind a gated door for their safety. Caesar realizes there may be a way out of the building through the basement of the textile shop, but as he's putting together the plan, he gets attacked and bitten by the health inspector, who's become a health infector, which lands both of them on the kill count. It's down to Manu, Angela and Pablo, since most everyone else, like that Japanese guy, are revealed to have been infected by now. Manu's able to put this dude down with the next snap though, which earns them a moment of peace. That is, until they're attacked by the Colombian woman, who does a real number on Angela until Pablo and Manu are able to choke her out. And sounds like her attack nearly did some actual damage in real life too. Un poquito más de fuerza y nos vamos las dos por la ventana para abajo. <laughs> The lights go out, and when Pablo turns on his camera light, it reveals that the Japanese woman is also infected now. She attacks them, just like the others did, until Manu puts her down with a mallet. They use that mallet to get into Guillaume's room, since he had the keys they'll need to escape through the basement. Manu stands guard outside while Angela and Pablo look for them, and eventually they find a custodian-sized key ring in a desk. Good luck with your guessing, y'all, especially since this whole damn place is full of infected folk 
including their pal Manu. Bummer. They abandon the basement plan and head to the top floor apartment instead, getting lucky enough with their key selection to get inside the penthouse in the nick of time. It's dark inside, and when Pablo turns on the camera light, they find themselves in a room filled with beakers and religious imagery. Just Jesus is out the wazoo, man. They also find newspaper clippings about a Portuguese girl named Tristana Medeiros, whose apparent possession was investigated by the Vatican. Further exploration of this exquisitely creepy apartment shows more documents pertaining to the Vatican's inspection, as well as a reel-to-reel -reel tape player. I mean, you gotta play that shit. You're in a horror movie. The recorded voice talks about Tristana and her contagious infection, and says that they're looking for a vaccine. Something tells me they never found one, though. A jump scare door swings open in front of them, leading up to a pitch black attic. Oh, yeah, me <laughs> I'd really rather you didn't, Pablo. But he sticks the camera up there anyway in a very scary slow pan shot. <laughs> that pants wetting scare also gives us another infected victim for the count, this random little attic boy. The boy's attack breaks the camera light, so we switch to night vision mode for the movie's finale. And these shots actually were filmed in complete darkness. The actors legit can't see anything here. They're not pretending. Pablo is the only one with any vision, thanks to his camera, and it's through the lens that he sees Javier Botet in silhouette down the hallway. Oh, he coming! Angela and Pablo hide as Botet's elongated figure stumbles around in the darkness. This is Tristana Medeiros, the so-called possessed girl from the clippings on the wall. And after 20 years of medical torture and abuse, her infection has left her looking like this. Botet, who's been lanking it up a lot on the kill count lately, had only a single small role in a 2005 Brian Usna film before appearing in Wreck as La Nina Medeiros. He would reprise this role for two of Wreck's sequels, even though the transformation required hours of makeup work. Very <laughs> you certainly are, Javier. But actually, you really are, Javier. You know what I mean? Pablo and Angela try to sneak past her, but Tristana hears and attacks them, killing Pablo after she knocks him to the ground with a hammer and beats him repeatedly. Oh, and then she eats his neck. So much neck biting in this movie. Angela briefly becomes our new cam op before she too is attacked and knocked to the ground. Though I'm leaving her off the kill count since apparently she's still alive in Wreck 2, even though this movie ends with her being dragged off screen. How many kills and or infections happen while you're sleeping? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh my god, I need to get to the numbers. Don't stop recording no matter what. 16 people were killed slash infected in wreck. There were six female victims and 10 male victims and probably a whole bunch more that we never got to confirm, like that elderly couple or the Japanese kid. With a runtime of only 78 minutes, that left us with a victim on average every 4.88 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Marie Carmen. Not because her death was particularly graphic, but more because it was particularly terrifying. Being handcuffed in place while some sicky storm you for food? That's the stuff of nightmares, man. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to the Colombian girl, who we just saw collapse in Signore Izquierdo's hallway. And that's it. Wreck came out in 2007 in Spain and was a big inspiration for the horror game Outlast, which I did a playthrough of on this channel a couple years ago. Wreck was such a hit that the US immediately made a very close remake called Quarantine. We'll look at that on Friday, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Hayden Brown, Chubbs, aka Ty Smith, Kane Thine, Aubrey Huntington, Flynn Lambert, and Freddie Allen. I hope everyone's safe and healthy right now. Please continue to listen to the health experts and self-isolate as much as possible. And if you have to go out there and work because you have an essential job, thank you so much. And be good people.